particularly those of you who have returned, because I'm aware that many of you have had me talking at your computer screen for quite a few weeks, although we've had a week off, of course. So uh, I do appreciate you tuning back in. I enjoyed preparing these sessions, and I'm glad so many people enjoy receiving them. Brilliant. So as Lucas said, this next series is focused on the kingdom of God, and we're going to define what it is and what it isn't, and hone in on some of the key aspects of living in the kingdom uh, of God itself. And in the last week, in week four, as I uh, had mentioned from Lucas at the beginning, we're going to look at the return of Jesus and some of the controversy uh, uh, around that. Um, but if you have your Bibles open, please can you turn to Matthew chapter four. And as you do that, I'm going to provide you with a little more about the, the, the term, the, the, the Wonderland term that I've used to name this course. Um, because I have young kids in, in my home, I get to watch a lot of Disney movies. And as I was preparing this series, uh, my mind went to the movie Alice in Wonderland, which was from a book that was published in 1865 by a man called Lewis Carroll, who uh, was lived in Darsbury. So he's a, a local boy to us here in Warrington and uh, a graduate of Oxford University, and all graduates of Oxford University are particularly awesome. I'm just saying that. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of, course that. of course, of course. Um, and he wrote this story about uh, a young girl called Alice, who he, he knew a girl called Alice, and he wrote this narrative around her life. And in the story, she goes, uh, she sees a white rabbit, and he disappears down a rabbit hole. She takes it upon herself to follow the rabbit, as perhaps she might do as a as a naive child and she goes down the rabbit hole but on the way down as she's tumbling down and down when she gets towards the bottom of the rabbit hole she starts to see that some of the furniture that's and other things is the other way up to the way that she is and in order to orientate her to be the right way up in this new world she has to turn herself upside down and in the beginning of the notes I've quoted Acts 17, 6 to 7, and I'll read it out to you now. And you'll see, I hope, an obvious link between what I just mentioned about Alice uh, as she enters Wonderland and the, the text here in Acts. It says, the mob dragged Jason and some of the brothers, that's the brothers in Christ. I imagine there were sisters in Christ there as well. Before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, and with another king there comes another kingdom, and that person, that king, is Jesus. Yeah. So the way that uh, it was perceived the Christians were living was almost upside down to the way that the rest of the world was living in the Greco-Roman Empire. It was yeah. completely back to front to them. But from a Christian perspective, to turn the world upside down is in fact to turn the world the right way up. Brilliant. By living differently, by acting differently, by having different sets of values and ideas, what we're doing is we're seeking to allow the world to come into line with the proper orientation of how it should be living. So from a world's perspective, Christians are living upside down. And from a Christian's perspective, the world is living upside down. And you can understand, therefore, that when those two worlds, those two kingdoms collide, and here it's contrasted between Jesus and Caesar, and we'll get on to the Jesus-Caesar contrast in, in, in later uh, seminars, but the conflict and the contrast between those caused problems for the church. Nevertheless, the church uh, determined not to uh, consign itself to having to live the way that the Roman Empire was trying to get it to live. They chose to live differently. They chose to live by different rules and by different values. But it was almost like Alice going into Wonderland for a Christian coming out of the Greco-Roman Empire in that people had to live very differently and think very differently in order to exist in this new world. Now in Alice in Wonderland, there are some strange creatures. Uh, there's, there's, there's these creatures that almost defy 
kind of logical definition, but they kind of resemble creatures uh, in our world, but they, they talk and they interact and they have crazy ideas. And she goes into a race where there is deliberately no end to the race and she has to swim in her own tears and she has to drink something to get small enough to go through one door, then eat something else to get big enough and change the size again. It's all this strange reorientation of shapes and proportions and the world is inverted to the way that Alice knows. And you can kind of understand that if people coming out of the Greco empire went into first century churches, they might think some of the things that you believe might as well be Alice in Wonderland stuff because it's, it's really bizarre and surreal some of the things you're telling us. I've got some examples here on page two of the notes in Matthew 5.11. It says, blessed are you when you are persecuted. Now in the Greco Roman world, when they're looking at people being flogged and crucified and, and, and basically um, subjugated to all kinds of torture, um, if they didn't conform to the pattern of the, of the Roman empire, there didn't seem to be any blessing in the treatment that people received. And yet this counter perspective, this Christian perspective on the world was, was completely at odds with the way the people in the Greco Roman world would have perceived going through some sort of thing. Now the Bible, Jesus in fact says that no one gets any benefit from being punished for doing something wrong but if you're punished for doing something right well then there is actual blessing invested in that so that's one verse i've got a few more here that i'll read through for you uh, mark 10 43 whoever wants to be great must become a servant now in the in the roman empire your servants were at the bottom of the pecking order they were the the lowest part of the of the, of the ladder of society so if you wanted to be esteemed and highly regarded well then you needed to be in the upper echelons that were with the kind of what you would say was the with the aristocracy the higher classes within the roman empire and and if you were part of the higher echelons of society well then you might be able in fact the the, uh, the role of servants within household was was far more popular and far more widely accepted of course than it is today and, and, and I'm glad we've moved away from that but of course in those days you 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 were wealthy and rich and, and therefore sought to have people do stuff for you and yet within the teaching teachings of Jesus himself he said if you want to become great well, then you need to take on the posture and the attitude of a servant this was again completely at odds with the culture and the system of the day. Matthew 5, 40, if someone wants to take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. I remember some years ago when I was ministering uh, at a different church, somebody I was witnessing to on the streets, they reminded me of this verse and they said, oh, shouldn't you give me your coat if I was to ask you for your coat? And I said, yes, and I actually gave them my coat, it was a young lad, he must have been about 14, 15, must have heard the story in Sunday school or some, ch some school assembly or something. And so I said, but I'm actually supposed to give you something as well. Well, of course, I'm not going to take my trousers off in the street, so I gave him my shoes. And, uh, and I ended up going home just in my socks. Now, I felt proud as punch that I'd actually lived out the, the, the letter of the law here, as it were, in this verse. But there are verses like this, which, again, are counterintuitive to people living in, in the system of the world, because that's not the kind of thing you do. You want to hold on to your possessions. If someone asks you for them, typically you would say, no, that's mine. I pay for it. I, I, I own that. But Jesus was saying you shouldn't have that same kind of definition of territory and possession that the world has. You know, if someone asks you for something, don't just deny them that. Give them something in addition. I mean, that starts to cause people to ask questions. What do you really believe deep down is, is, is going on in the world if you're prepared to live, live like that? And another verse here, Matthew 16 to 21, I've paraphrased what Jesus is saying just for, for the sake of brevity, Jesus brought life to the world by dying in it. I could have quoted some other passages of scripture to you as well, particularly in 1 Corinthians where Paul says the Greeks seek wisdom and the Jews want a sign and we preach Christ crucified. We preach a dying Messiah. And that was almost like a contradiction in terms. Why would somebody who's come to save the world actually do so by losing their, their life? How can they redeem a world by themselves dying. It seemed to be a preposterous notion. And Paul recognized that what he was saying seemed preposterous to the minds and the ears of the people listening in. But he was coming from this upside down world. He was coming from this back to front kingdom as far as the world was concerned. And Paul 
knew it was not going to be uh, received and understood like he wanted it to be received and understood, but he couldn't water it down or change the truth. The truth was the truth. And so you had this clash of worlds, this clash of kingdoms, this clash of ideas, this clash, this clash of values as Christianity began to move across the Greco-Roman world. Some several hundred years later in, in the beginning of the fourth century when the Emperor Constantine um, adopted Christianity as his preferred religion. Debate exists whether he was genuinely a Christian or not, but things began to change then, and because the emperor adopted Christianity, that was the beginning of Christian values and ideas becoming more widely embraced and accepted, often because people wanted to draw close to the emperor by, by aligning themselves with ideas he was fond of, maybe not from a genuine, genuine repentance and faith. But the world then began to accept Christian values. And so we take it for granted these days that even if people don't agree with Christianity, if people don't um, accept there is a God or believe that Jesus was any more than a good man whose stories had been exaggerated through a kind of a, a sophisticated set of kind of Chinese whispers, people are aware of the ideas. But as the church emerged into the world, again, it was like Alice coming into Wonderland. It was upside down, back to front stuff. It was inside out. And yet this was all part of the kingdom. And so we find ourselves as Christians as citizens of another kingdom, although we live in this world. Ephesians 2.19 says, Consequently, consequentially, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. Now, Paul says you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but to the outside world, we seem very foreign and strange to them by living in this kingdom, but aligning ourselves with God's family and, be, and being citizens of his kingdom, it's better to be a stranger to the world than a stranger to God. And it's all part of learning to live within God's kingdom. Now, what I want to do now is to begin to address, before I come on to this passage in Matthew, I want to, be, to, to begin to address a couple of basic errors and mistakes that happen when people begin to engage with this idea of the kingdom of God based on a superficial reading of of the Bible which I just need to just clarify to you before we go deeper into this teaching of the kingdom of God and the first thing is just to help you to know that the kingdom of God is not the church the kingdom of God is not the church. I'm just going to read Psalm 103. You don't need to turn to it because I've told you about the passage in Matthew. I mean, unless you particularly want to, of course. It says in Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. So in the psalm here, which was a prophetic foreshadowing of the kingdom of God teaching, which we're going to engage with over these next coming weeks, there is a distinction made between the reigning kingdom of God, the rulership of God and people. And the church is the body and the church is within the kingdom of God. But the church isn't the definition of the kingdom of God. So the church exists as an integral part of the kingdom, but it isn't itself the kingdom. That's the first thing that you need to understand. And uh, the second thing I would say to you is when you read in the Gospels where it says the, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, they are in essence saying the exact same thing. The phrase the kingdom of heaven only appears in Matthew's Gospel. And I've given some examples on page three of your notes where you can read the same passage in Luke or Mark as is referred to in Matthew. And Mark and Luke will describe the kingdom of God and Matthew will call it the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Well, the reason commonly accepted is that Matthew was writing to a predominantly Jewish audience for whom to mention uh, God was a very holy thing. And they didn't want to use uh, the, the word God 
in their writing glibly and quickly and easily, although the word God does appear in Matthew's gospel. So it seems to be as a kind of an apologetic tool and as a courtesy to his readers that Matthew has chosen the phrase kingdom of heaven. But you need to know when you're reading the Bible, those mean the same things. The first thing is that the church isn't itself the kingdom of God, although it exists within the kingdom of God. It's an integral part of the kingdom of God. The second thing is that when the Bible speaks about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, it's referring to uh, the same thing. The next thing I would draw your attention to is that if you want to understand what the kingdom of God is, if it's not the church and it's not a people group, is that we need to therefore establish what it is. And I've given you an example here, and it's well worth reading it through. And for our one known American who's uh, part of our church for Lindsay, I've given us an American uh, example here, which uh, you, you will know. And if, if, if those of you regret it, 1776 and the, and the process of independence, you will lament this. And if you're American, you'll celebrate this. But what I've put here is a way of articulating what the kingdom of God is using a sentence construction about monarchy. If I've put here, there are two grammatically acceptable ways of constructing the following sentence. You could put during the kingdom of King George, the colonies of America re rebelled against the kingdom of England. That is a grammatical, grammatically acceptable way of constructing that sentence. During the kingdom of King George, the colonies of America rebelled against the kingdom of England. But I could also say during the reign of King George, the colonies of America rebelled against the reign of England. And this is essentially what the kingdom of God is. is it is the reign and the rule of God. So the church sits under yeah. the reign and the rule of God, Very good. but it itself is not the reign and the rule of God. In theory, God should reign over everything. Well, he does reign over everything the church does in one sense, but we're in the process of bringing all of our lives into a shape and a form and a set of actions and values that more clearly represent to the world what the reign and the rule of God looks like. So the kingdom of God is the reign and the rule of God. Now, if you're to read around and watch on the internet, many people will stop there and simply say that the kingdom of God is the reign and the rule of God. But there is a, a, an extra level of definition that I want to offer to you from Luke 17, 20 to 21. I'll read it out to you. It says, once on being asked by the Pharisees when, and you could underline that word there, when, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, I'll explain more about what the kingdom of God in your midst means later on. But the, the first thing I want to draw your attention to there from those two verses, the Pharisees said when the kingdom of God would come. Now, if the kingdom of God uh, was already in force, as it were, in Israel, they wouldn't have to ask, when is this happening? When I read Psalm 103, verse 19, I explained from that prophetic verse that it was spoken about the rulership and the reign of God in his kingdom, in the throne of heaven, over all the peoples of the earth. So the Jewish people understood that ultimately God was sovereignly in charge over all things and all people over all the earth. And yet, despite that reigning and ruling being in place by God, the Jewish people didn't believe the kingdom of God had come. So how could those two things not have happened. How could the kingdom of God in one sense exist and yet not be outworking itself on the earth? The Jewish people here, the reason they asked when the kingdom of God 
would, would come was not simply because the kingdom of God that Jesus talked about and God helped the, through Christ helped the people to understand more about. It wasn't simply about God reigning and ruling. It was the season and the time of God's reign and rule on the earth. So the kingdom of God is the reign and the rule, but the kingdom of God, as it was understood by the Jewish listeners to Jesus' message, they weren't just trying to get their head around the fact that God reigned and ruled. They knew that. They had seen that. They had points of reference in their history where God had intervened in the story of their, of their, of their journey with him and shown uh, his hand. He defeated armies and he had brushed aside Pharaoh's army. I'm going to get onto that in a moment. But they so they understood that, that that God was reigning and ruling, but they were still looking for the kingdom of God. So why? Because it was actually a time and a season. And this, if you look at page four on the notes, was why there was a lot of early confusion about Jesus's ministry. Because just before Jesus Jesus's public ministry happened. John the Baptist appeared on the scene saying to people, repent for the kingdom of God is near or in some translations at hand. So he was saying right now, just ahead of us, we're about to roll over in time in the chronology of our existence. We're about to emerge into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. God reigns and God rules in heaven, but they were looking for the reign and the rule on earth. So when we see in the Bible about the reign and the rule of God, we're, we're talking about the reign and the rule of God coming to earth. The problem was that when Jesus came and he began to declare that the kingdom of God has come and he was driving out demons and he was proclaiming the good news, etc. And we'll, we'll deal with that over the coming weeks. They had a concept of that coming of the kingdom of God, which looked quite different to the way Jesus was acting in the context of the kingdom of God, because what they were expecting was something far more dramatic and far more cataclysmic for their enemies. So as I'm coming to the conclusion of this first section of defining what the kingdom of God is and isn't, and what was perceived in the minds of the Jewish listeners to Jesus's message when he spoke about the kingdom of God, this was all of the ideas and the concepts that they had building up within them. So when they were hearing the announcement that the kingdom of God is coming, they were going, great, we're about to roll into the time and season where God's reign and rule over all people in heaven will manifest itself into the reign and the rule of people on earth. And therefore, they could only imagine one thing that this person would want to do as, as, as they brought the reign and the rule in through this Messiah that they expected. Surely he would want to do what he did in previous times with pharaohs and other governments, surely he would want to sweep them aside. Surely he would want to vindicate the nation of Israel and vanquish the, uh, the, Jew, the foes of the, of the Jewish people. But Jesus didn't do that. In Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 2, very interesting, the first thing Jesus preaches, and you can read this in Luke 4, 18 to 19, He's quoting from Isaiah 61, where we get a lot of stuff about the kingdom. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And then he goes on recovery of sight to the blind and, 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 and the, the deaf are going to hear, the lame are going to walk. But if you read the background in Isaiah, that's not what Isaiah said. He said, and the vengeance of our God. So when Jesus stands up in a synagogue, and you read this in Luke 4, 8, 18, and he starts speaking about the coming of the kingdom of God, and he's saying that basically by virtue of the fact that I have the anointing upon me, I am the anointed one, and that's what the term Messiah means. He starts declaring all the good stuff, and so the Jewish people are listening out, yeah, 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 you're going to turn the tables on our enemies, aren't you? And Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. Okay, so let's... let's Pause that thought there and let's go back into the Old Testament a little more after I've read to you Matthew 4, 13 to 17. Okay, 
There's a couple of things here I want to draw out that you may miss if you don't read your Bible with a commentary or a, 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 another kind of handbook to the Bible with you. But Matthew 4, 13 to 17, it says, Leaving Nazareth, that's hearing after, if you read back in the narrative, John the Baptist has just been arrested, who's been proclaiming this coming near of the kingdom of God, this rolling over into this new age where God's reign in heaven would become rule and reign on earth. It says that he went to live in Capernaum, uh, which was by the lake in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has now come here. From that time on, Jesus began to proclaim the kingdom of God. So there are a couple of things here we need to draw out from the text to get the fullest understanding in. First of all, why is this Zebulun and Naphtali so important that Jesus should begin this declaration of the kingdom of God in this region. Now, for those of you who know the Old Testament background, we know that in the history of Israel, there were some significant moments to the, to the nation of Israel, first around 722 BC, when ten, the 10 tribes, which were not Benjamin and Judah, were, were uh, defeated by the Assyrian Empire. And then in 586, after a, a season of existing without those 10 northern tribes, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah were defeated by the Babylonians. Now, Zebulun and Naphtali were part of this, this, these 10 tribes which were in the north. And this is not at the, exactly the same time as the writing of Isaiah, but in the general ballpark, give or take a few years, depending on who you read for the timing of Isaiah. But the land of Zebulun and Naphtali was the gateway for the enemies who would want to come and attack Israel. That was the corridor and the pathway in the geography of Israel that the enemies of God would come through in order to lay siege and attack God's people. They were situated in bands across the north from the Galilee over to the Mediterranean Sea. So the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they would have to come through the slither of land through that gateway of Naphtali or Zebulun. So this is almost like a declaration of war by Jesus that he would stand on the brink of this area and say to you, now the coming of the kingdom has come. Previously in the history of Israel, they'd seen the coming of the Assyrian kingdom and they'd seen the coming of the Babylonian kingdom and they'd known that the, 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 the reign and the rule of the Persians and the Babylonians and the Medes and you could go on and describe all of the things that had gone on in the conflict of their history. And strategically, Jesus chooses this as his launch point to say now the kingdom of God has come and he would move his ministry towards Jerusalem from this corridor of war that was established in the history of Israel. He was declaring a new kingdom was about to come upon Israel. Israel. They'd seen the other nations seek to assert their kingdoms, and Jesus was now about to assert his kingdom. And so from there, he goes on to declare the coming of the kingdom of God, and he begins to call 12 disciples. Why is that number significant? Well, eventually he calls some more, and he whittles them down to 12, because there were originally 12 tribes of Israel. So as part of his kingdom, he's starting to reset the clock on who God's people were by gathering 12. Originally there were 12 tribes, and now he's gathering around these 12 disciples. Sorry, Siri's interjecting there. I should have taken my watch off. And so he goes around and he starts calling people to come and follow him. And when you read that, it's almost kind of presumptuous language. Jesus is like him walking into a bar saying, hey, you guys, come and follow me. 
you would think, who's this Billy Big Shot walking in here? Tell us who, who, who we should and shouldn't follow. And that's kind of the point. Jesus is walking into the world like he's the boss now and he actually owns the place. I don't know if you've ever had this situation uh, at work. I've had a line manager some, some years ago uh, when I was working um, for a, a, a department within the government nothing sophisticated, uh, but it's just one of the kind of administration departments within the government. And I used to have this, this line manager who used to walk around the office like he owned the place. Now, he didn't own the place because he was just a line manager. He wasn't the boss. Now, I'm talking about a department there, but you could transfer that into a situation where maybe it was a business and the line manager walked around like they own the place and the staff will be saying, well, actually, you've got some jurisdiction of authority that's delegated to you here, but you don't actually own the place. The owner owns the place. You're the managers. And it was like the Pharisees and the people at the time who were walking around like they own the place. They were the line managers that had delegated authority at that time. But now the owner had rocked up onto the scene. It come from an area of the land which was where the previous empires who had come to attack Israel and, 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 and Jerusalem had come from. And he was starting there saying, your enemies are behind me. Jerusalem is in front of me. I'm now calling people unto myself and I'm going to walk around here like the, I own the place because I'm here to establish and assert a new kingdom on this land. And so Jesus emerged with this sense of authority. And so people would have been looking at him thinking, wow, this guy means business. He's come from the north, from these warring regions. He's making his way south, although he's starting in Galilee. He's gathering a new 12 underneath him, and he's walking around like he owns the place. And Jesus could actually say that because he could say, yes, I, I do own the place. Very good. Though. Now, how do we fit in that? And so in order to answer that question, we need to go back to Genesis 1, verses 27 to 28. And so you're thinking that from the last series that where I dealt with the book of Genesis, maybe we were done with the Genesis story, but we're not. I just want to go to Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Uh, I haven't got this on your notes, uh, um, just because it's good for you to turn to some things in your Bible as well, rather than me kind of just put it all on paper. But it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And listen to this. And subdue it and have dominion. And in some translations, have rule. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the first time we see the concept of ruling, the concept of reigning, the concept of dominion in the Bible, when we talk about the first mention of this idea, we get back here into Genesis where God wants to share his rule and reign with his people, his sons and his daughters. He invites humanity, he invites the man and the woman here, he invites them in to share, to, to reign and to rule and to operate with dominion on the earth. The problem was that man, Adam and Eve, in the first instance, they lost a, their, their, their godly uh, entitlement to rule and reign in large part because they sinned. They sinned and they stepped out from under that authority that they were given initially. But you see here, it's God's desire not only to rule and to reign, but part of being created in the image of God, because there is a link here between dominion and bearing the image of God, in the same way that I've mentioned in the previous study, that to be made in God's image is to have emotions, to have thoughts, to have will, to have relationships, to love, to have value. As much as they are an integral part of what it means to be created in God's image, 
God also wants you to know that to be created in God's image is in that he has rulership and dominion and his heart is to share dominion and ruling with his people. So God wants you and he wants me to rule and to reign with him. He's invited, that blows my mind, that God would invite us human creatures to come and to be involved in the ruling and the reigning on earth. And so when Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and by putting it at our will, and I mentioned this in the last study, uh, in, in conformity to God's will, we are building the kingdom of God. We are co-reigners and co-rulers with Christ as we build his kingdom by doing the things that he has delegated to us to do. So that's back in Genesis. Now, the first mention of God as king, however, within that language actually appears in Exodus 15, verses 1 to 2 and 18. So if you can, you can turn there quick enough. Turn to Exodus 15, 1 to 2 and verses 18 as well. It says this, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, um, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. And in verse 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. So reigning and ruling could be, as I mentioned at the beginning, you can put the word kingdom or king in there because you can't you can't use king as a verb as such you a run it becomes a runner but a king isn't a kinger so it's got the word reign in there the lord will king the lord will kingdom the lord will rule and reign forever so the first actual mention although in genesis we get this heart of god sharing with humanity that he wants humanity to to, to share in the ruling and the reigning and have dominion on earth they uh, relinquish response uh, not responsibility but they relinquish their their power and their authority to do that by stepping outside of God's authority by disobeying him but in this context we have here God has just vanquished the Pharaoh and his empire which was in that day the most powerful empire on planet earth and so they're celebrating and they're saying we have just for several hundred years lived under the most powerful king the most powerful ruler on planet earth and god has shown that he is the king of kings by sweeping the king of this earth who stood at the top of the world's pecking order aside he has collapsed him in, into the water into the red sea and he has brought that dominion to an end and his dominion we can see has greater authority and greater power than any dominion on earth because if the pharaoh couldn't stop god if his enchanters couldn't outperform miracles yeah. for the king of kings then then god is saying if you want to know what the king of kings looks like well then you need to look to me and so the people of israel were recovering their sense of being not just under god but under a god who could intervene and establish and exert his authority over the dominions of the earth now the next passage i want us to go to and we'll probably come to a close uh, just after this is in isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 to 2 and then 6 to 7. I'm just going to turn in my Bible uh, there. So coming to Isaiah, writing somewhere probably, there's lots of interesting debates uh, around the dating of Isaiah. Imagine if Dougal's watching this, he would be sitting talking to himself about the different datings of Isaiah. Somewhere around the 8th, century BC, around the time that the Assyrian army was uh, coming to, to, to seek to establish its kingdom reign and rule over the people of God. We get the, the location of Jesus's uh, Isaiah reference, which form the backdrop of his declaration that the kingdom of God had come near in Matthew chapter 4. In verse 2 of chapter 9 of Isaiah, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land 
uh, of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. In fact, I should have gone to verse one actually there. Nevertheless, there'll be no more gloom for those who are living in distress in the past. He humbled the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea and by way of the Jordan. That's verse one. But going on to verse six and seven, he says, for us, a child is born yeah. and for us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, mm -hmm. Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace and of the greatness of his government and his peace. There will be no end. He will rule on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. Listen to that last word, forever. So when we arrive at Isaiah, we've got this backdrop of the kingdom of God, which we can root right back in the very first pages of your Bible, in, in the first chapter of Genesis, about when God established the earth, it was his heart to want to share dominion, to share rule on earth. It was part of being an image bearer, to carry, carry responsibility to rule and reign on God's behalf. That was lost as, we, as humanity fell in the Garden of Eden. But then in the story of the people of God, eventually when we get to God's people being um, brought under the reign and the rule of Pharaoh, who was the most powerful leader on the planet at the time. God shows that he's not only a God in heaven, but he can be a king and a ruler on earth. He sweeps Pharaoh aside. After this going on some years, eventually this people of Israel, once they are given their own land, they come under a king called David, and most of you who are watching this will know where David fits in, in the narrative. He was the second king of Israel, Saul being the first. The kingdom was taken away from Saul and given to David. But David's rule didn't last forever. It was given to his son, to Solomon, after that. And then there was this conflict between one of the sons and a, another person within his household, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the conflict there. But it was moving away from, eventually, from, 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 from David's line, and then it stopped because eventually both Judah and Benjamin were taken over by the Babylonians as the northern tribes had been taken over by the Assyrians some years early. And what Isaiah is saying here, I'm actually going to establish a new king over Israel from the line of David. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God his everlasting father, the prince of peace. And he says he will uh, uh, uphold King David's throne forever and ever. So what he's saying is that there will never come another kingdom that will be able to usurp this particular king who is coming to the earth. His kingdom will be the final kingdom. There will be never a kingdom to come and replace this kingdom. It will be a forever kingdom. So when Jesus comes onto the scene and he starts off in the region of Naphtali and he comes from that region of Galilee and he eventually works his way through down to Jerusalem and he takes upon himself this authority to call and to gather people to himself. He has this forerunner in John the Baptist saying, guys, we're about to roll over into the kingdom of God. This age where God's reign and rule will happen on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus then, as he's recognized publicly, beginning to take on that mantle, to take messianic verses of scripture and take them onto himself, and then declare the kingdom of God has come. And with his ministry, there is the coming of the kingdom of God. There was this sense of expectation that Jesus was about to completely turn the world upside down. But the way they conceived that upside down to happen was that Jesus would turn the enemies of God upside down. But the first thing Jesus was going to do was turn the people of God upside down. 
They were not ready to turn the world upside down until God had done something upside down in their hearts and in their minds. Until God had established his kingdom, his kingdom which would have seen upside down to many, he had established that in the hearts and in the minds of God's people, they were not ready to turn the world outside of them upside down until God had transformed them and turned them around and upside down on the inside. In fact, the word repent means from metanoia in the Greek, means to turn around and go in a different direction. And so the repentance had to begin with God's people in context here in the New Testament, originally with God's people, the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. But then that upside down would happen in the hearts and minds of people all across the world. But there isn't yet the fullness of the judgment which God has in the Old Testament prophesied that would also come. And I'll close with this. When Jesus quoted Isaiah 61 in Luke 4, 18 and 19, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim captivity to the captive. And he doesn't go on to say the rest of Isaiah 61, verse 2, and the judgment of God. Isaiah was not wrong to say that the judgment of God was coming. What Jesus was doing was saying that the judgment part of that prophecy has not come in the way that you understood it would come, but he doesn't say it wasn't coming. And the final thing to offer into your mind, and we have to unpack this bit, bit more week by week, was this word, the day of the Lord. And when we get into other parts of the New Testament, with, particularly with, with Paul's uh, teaching, he talks about the coming, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. That is an Old Testament phrase to speak of the intervention, the coming judgment of God upon the earth. So Jesus, recognizing that the Jewish people were expecting the judgment of God to come in a way that dealt with the enemies of the nation of Israel, God's first stage was to judge the hearts and the minds of people by turning their inside world, their value system upside down, their ways of thinking upside down, before he came and brought judgment and collapsed the systems of this world and brought them to nothing. So as Jesus came as king, as Jesus emerged on the scene, as he came from a region where the previous empires had come from to come towards Jerusalem, declaring a new reign and a new rule had come on the earth. As he starts to gather a new people with him, a new 12 as a symbol of a reformation of God's people. And he begins to share with them the authority of the kingdom of heaven on earth as he himself was manifesting through his ministry. He was not saying that there wouldn't come a judgment, but what he was saying was now is the time to judge your hearts and your motives and your attitudes, to judge your value system, to turn the inner world that you have upside down, which will have ramifications for the world around you. But eventually there will come a time when God will do the rest of the thing he spoke about in the Old Testament, and he will judge the whole of the world and bring uh, 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 an end to all things. And he will completely uh, establish his full reign and full full authority over every empire and over every nation of the world. But we can't deal with that bit until we get to week four. So we're going to end there. I see there are 26 comments in the chat bar. So yeah, I don't... We, we, now we've been encouraging you, mate. So just one thing, Dave, on page four of your notes, um, you've got a lovely little diagram at the top there of John the Baptist. Yeah. It would be a shame if you didn't refer to that because obviously you put a lot of work into that diagram. Nick McDavid put a lot of work into that diagram. Credit, yeah, no, credit you. No, it's what? a picture of John the Baptist on at the top of page four. Sure, I know, I know, I know the 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 the, um, the picture. So what I've got there, although for some reason it's not among the notes that are on my pages here, I do know it well enough. Yeah. The understanding of the people at the time, the Jewish people, was that they had the age that they lived in. But there was a coming age, an age to come, which was the reign and the rule of God, the coming kingdom of God. And so when John the Baptist announced the kingdom of God is near, they're like, OK, time is about to roll over into a new age, into the coming age. And in fact, when this diagram was um, initially 
put on there for for, for understandable reasons of the of the aesthetic of the thing. Um, uh, um, Nick put the the age to come to the right hand side of that diagram. Yes. And I asked him to reset it and bring it more to the left. Yeah. Because in the understanding of the Jewish people, that it wasn't a long way in advance when John was saying that. They were expected literally to roll into that. Okay, this is about to happen now. And in fact, with the coming of Jesus, that has come. And in some senses, the kingdom of God is now in the age to come. But the fullness of the kingdom hasn't come on earth as it is in heaven. There is a growing establishing of the kingdom of God on earth. So we live in what's called the now and the not yet of kingdom. The future is present. The future reign and rule of God is present on the earth. But we don't yet see visibly over all people the outworking effects of the reign and the rule of God. Because there are people who still live in rebellion to God, who don't conform to the pattern of God. In fact, there are many Christians who still live in many ways in, in non-conformity to the pattern of the kingdom of God. And in this season that we're in, with the establishment where that line is in the, in the diagram, we've rolled into that. But the coming age hasn't happened and take, isn't taking place as it was traditionally conceived that it would take place. They conceived that this judgment would come, that people would, would, would be brought into a new season of holiness and righteousness and, 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 and obedience to God's law. And this Messiah figure would come and sit on David's throne, as was spoken about from that passage in Isaiah chapter 9. And there are other passages in the notes where you can see contrasts and, and connections between Isaiah and with Luke, where th th those messianic passages are taken on by Jesus but they were saying okay well if you're the Messiah well where's the rest of it if you're walking around here like Johnny Big Shot telling everybody to come and follow you and to do what you say and you've come from this region supposedly as God's anointed one well where where are the shields and the swords that we need to deal with the Romans because when we heard the, the kingdom of God spoken about in the Old Testament the, the very first time we hear your name mentioned as king and as ruler you had just defeated the armies of Egypt so why aren't you defeating the armies of Rome and so to understand the kingdom of God we need to see this not as, a, as a, a, an exertion of God's authority over territory and over armies but the beginning of the kingdom of God is something that transforms the inner person in the way that they live, their value system. And we'll yeah. look at that more next week. Yeah, that's really good.